Hey, what you guys are about to see is an interview that I did with Stefan Fox, who is the General Secretary of IFMA. Um, he's been working for a very long time towards getting Muay Thai in the Olympics. So we went to talk to him and interview him about the chances of Muay Thai being in the 2024 Paris Olympics. We talked to him about a lot of things because anytime you talk to Stefan, he's brilliant and nothing that he does is singular. So everything connects to all these other projects that are important for the main projects that they're working on. So we talked about a lot of things, but to me it was important to talk to him about what the current status of uh, Muay Thai being included in the Olympics in Paris in 2024 is. I would love to fight for the American team in 2024 and planning this far in advance when he's been planning on it for decades is uh, definitely something to talk about. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Well, so just to, to start out, what is the current state of um, Muay Thai for the 2024 Olympics in Paris? So, uh, first of all, let me congratulate you on your fighting career. <laughs> we follow you. I think you are now the highest decorated female fighter in the world. I don't think there's any more girls which have more fights than you, so that's truly an achievement. Thank you. Coming to the Olympics, again, there are different steps. Mm. Okay, for us, the Olympics are just not the Olympic Games. There's so many, there's the Youth Olympics, mm -hmm. okay, which is in 2022 in Africa. Oh, okay. Then 2026, uh, it will maybe come back to Asia. Mm -hmm. So for us, one of the key stones for our work is obviously the use. I believe this, no, no use, no future. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is for me the key point. So again, for us, we turn the pyramid upside down. Okay, if you look at the sporting pyramid, let's say football, mm -hmm. it's the best example, everyone knows football. If you look at the sporting pyramid, no one really cares about the base. Mm -hmm. Only they care about the top, the Ronaldo's, the superstars, you know, the Manchester City, the Manchester United, Real Madrid, this is what the people want. Mm. Okay, but the base where football is really played is on the bottom mm. of the pyramid. So for us in IFMA, years ago, we have turned the pyramid upside down, meaning we made the kids our main focus for all our work. Mm. So this is why our youth world championships are so massive. Yeah. Like last year in Bangkok, uh, we had over 90 countries mm. and over 1,000 kids. I think that for any sport, that's an amazing number. Mm. We cannot go any bigger because we had four rings, mm. <clears throat> four rings, uh, and every day six hours of fighting. It's impossible to get any bigger. So now we obviously have to cut mm. down a little. But for us, having this youth world championship is not about fighting. Fighting is an important part, but if you look, four rings, probably. 180 to 200 fights per day, meaning you have 180 to 200 kids which don't make it right. in the second round. Right. So this is where we then have the chance to do other activities with these kids. Mm. Cultural here. stuff. Yeah. You know, Waikou, uh, Moai Buran, we do seminars, we do courses. So this is where we have become very strong. Last year at the Youth World Championship, I think we made history for the first time, we had nearly 1,000 kids mm. from 90 countries in the United Nations headquarter here in Bangkok, where normally the leaders of the world sit to make good or bad decisions, let's <laughs> say it like this. The kids were sitting in that seat and discussed about their own problems. Yeah. And there you had Iran and Israel, Palestine, mm. okay, all these kids sitting together in the United Nations headquarter talking about sport, mm. talking about their own problems, and we see that these kids, they're real. Mm. Unity and diversity really means something for them because of Muay Thai, because of the cultural exchange in our sport. I don't think there's another sport where the players go into the different corner and drink each other's water yeah. after, <laughs> after a bout. So because of this, where after the competition, right. we become friends again and we drink the same water, we sweat mm. the same way. I think this makes us apart from other sports. So for us, the use is the most important part of our daily work. Mm. Because if you can get the kids right, then the future looks right. If you get the kids wrong, we have no future. 
So the actual fact of whether Muay Thai is included in the 2024 Olympics in Paris is kind of not the most important point because the process towards this is creating so many other opportunities. You, we have an old saying. Mm. It is not a destination, it's a journey. Mm. Mm. Okay, and along this journey, it's really important. To be honest, the 2024 Olympics, we don't even put that much emphasis on it. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, the decision is already basically made mm. for urban sports. Mm. This, the, the IOC thinks exactly the same way as we do. You must go with the youth. There's surfing, right. there's rock climbing, there's skateboarding. They just added breakdancing. And breakdancing. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they also go with the youth development. Right. Okay, and you can see that these urban sports are now very important because no disrespect, but hammer throws and spear throwing and all these things. It's important because this is the original mm. uh, Olympic Games, but on the end of the day, how many of the youth are really going to throw a hammer? Right. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so they're out there. They want to skateboard. They want to surf. They want right. to rock climb. They want to be urban. Right. You know, and urban is uh, an important part of our life. It doesn't cost much money. Three by three basketball, mm. you can play anywhere. Mm. Mm. And this is very important that we go in that direction. We go in the same direction. Mm. Okay, and we understand that for 2024 in Paris, which is an urban feel and look, our chances are very small. Mm. Okay? Oh. So we have to think. Mm. But then we go 2022, the Youth Olympics are in Africa. Yeah. In a developing country. Right. In a continent, so to say, where most of the sports have similar problems. Right. Okay, because maybe in Germany we think about do I wear Reebok or Adidas or Puma shoes, right. you know, before I go on the pitch. I think the problems in Africa are much more serious, you know, yeah. and uh, we're talking about do you have water to drink after right. you run, right. you know what I mean? Do you have proper food, mm. do you have proper education, it's done mm. right there. So in Africa we're facing uh, totally different challenges mm. in sport than, uh, than by example we face in, in Germany. Right. Okay, so for us, Africa is a very important continent mm. in general because there we can build from the grassroots and bolster the kids. Yeah. We can involve our social projects. Yeah. Okay, which we have been done very successful for the last years, mm. and we can involve our partners, mm. UNESCO, UN Women, mm. Right to Play, and so on, also to involve in our development work there. So for us, the Youth Olympics 2022. 2026 would be our main focus. Mm. Mm. Okay, and then Paris, to be honest, it's not really. Uh, well, for those of us who are praying that Olympics will be, the Muay Thai will be in the Olympics in 2024, is there anything for us to ho hang our hope on? Uh, the fact that France is very strong in Muay Thai, uh, is anything working out that might this, break our way? At this stage, four sports have been put forward. Okay, they're all urban sports. Mm. Karate, by example, is was, not was in. out, right? Karate Baseball is, out. is not in. Mm. Okay, Muay Thai is not in. So uh, these four uh, urban sports, but we don't know what the development right. will be. Yeah. Okay, because maybe the Olympics gonna lose some of their core sports. Okay, uh, maybe that issues within the Olympic movement without now naming sports. Right. You know, some because of governance, some because yeah. of doping. So we don't know until after Tokyo uh, 2020, if maybe some of the core sports will uh, will be out. We understand that boxing has major issues oh. in the Olympic movement as it stands uh, at the moment. Boxing is... Uh, so so four sports have been put forward. Yes. And that, does that mean then they choose from those four no, these generally? Four sports, these four sports have been put forward uh, to be included mm. for sure. Oh, And okay. this will be happening in the next couple of months okay. at the IOC executive board meeting and then obviously at the General Assembly and so on. But that does not necessarily mean there will be no others. Right. Okay? But for now, these are the four sports. We already have sent congratulation letters to them. All these <laughs> presidents are actually close friends of mine. Mm. I pity, obviously, our friends from karate and baseball, mm. which didn't make it. So right. now, mm. make it. So they're obviously lobbying now hard. Uh, but this is, this is the way of a competition is. Sometimes you make it, sometimes you don't. But we focus on so many other events. Of course. Okay, there's many other things. We have the Asian Games coming up mm -hmm. in China. Wow. Okay, uh, in 2022. There is uh, the 2023 European Games, uh, which will be decided where it is. Uh, we try to get to the Pan American Games. Mm -hmm. There is the 
indoor Asian games, there's the Asian beach games. We must ensure that we keep our place in the world games. So the yes. Olympic, on the end of the day, it is the highest event of all. Of course, yeah. But it's only an event for 100 or maybe 150 athletes. Right. Okay, at the maximum. So the other events, the other opportunities, given university, the university cluster, the combat games, mm -hmm. the uh, Asian, European, Pan American, the African games. So also for them, we must give the continents the chance to be part of the Olympic movement. So there are so many different events we can be in. And wh where are they thinking the next Olympics after Paris might be, or is that not even That's Los rumored? Angeles, Los Angeles, they've already have it. Yes. Wow. So for us, as I said, regardless what, the journey will not stop. Right. We applied to be recognized as an international sport in 1999. <laughs> we got rejected in 2004 and 2005. Mm -hmm. In 2006, finally, and by overwhelming majority, because by then we knew how to promote ourselves and how to get there, we got recognized under the name of Muay Thai, very important, right. under the name of Muay Thai as an international recognized sport governing the art and sport of Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. That was in 2006. Then it took us five years from there to work, to be confident enough to put in our application to be recognized by the International Olympic Committee, which is the next step. Mm -hmm. That took us another five years. Right. In 2016, we got recognized by the International Olympic Committee, which is very, very important. But along the way, between 2006 and 2016, we got recognized by FISU. Mm -hmm. We got included in the World Games. So we picked up important other events along the way. And this will be the same for the future plan. Mm -hmm. A lot of, um, in the US, for example, everything is varied by state. The scoring is varied by state. The sanctioning is varied by state. And there's a push right now to kind of unify and bring things closer to international scoring and things like this. Is there any kind of um, presence from the IFMA officially in terms of training people, maybe in European unions or in the US? Or is this kind of just um, an effort made by each country to kind of find their way towards IFMA international scoring? I mean, first of all, we have to admit, sport is changing, mm. always, and so are we. You know, so we have to go with the times. Mm. Okay, I mean, look at female fighting, by example. Female competing it has totally changed in the last, you know, let's say five years. And I think we are proud mm. of many things because in the last World Championship in Mexico, for the first time, we had a 50-50 uh, male and female ratio in the elite division. That is Amazing. groundbreaking for us. I think it's groundbreaking for any combat sports. Yes. I don't think there are many which have an elite, elite level of 50-50. And for that, now in the World Games in 2021, mm -hmm. there will be six male and six female divisions. So this is for us very, very important because this was one of our key, besides the youth, the female mm -hmm. development mm -hmm. was very important for us because 10 years ago, Muay Thai was very much a male-dominated sport from top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now we can say, having two female continental presidents, okay, having a 50-50 ratio in the, in the competitions, yeah. we achieved what we have set out. In fact, the plan was to have it in 2021, so we are two years ahead of time yeah. in our own strategic plan. So we're happy with this. Mm -hmm. On the technical side, obviously, that needs to be worked on. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know this very well, because as the competition grows, we need more referees, judges, officials, which are on the same level. Right. Okay, so we have 24 head judges, we call them ITOs, okay, which serve the five continents. They are in charge of ensuring that all the national federations uh, follow exactly the same criteria. Twice a year we do workshops mm -hmm. for new ones, so the scoring has become much better. Do these officials offer training in their home countries to the reps and judges and officials that do kind of more um, 
ground level fights? There is three levels. Mm -hmm. One is the national, mm -hmm. one is the continental, and one is the world. Mm -hmm. So in order, in order to get to the next level, okay, you need to have a certain experience right. at the national level. Right. Coming to the world level, you pick them. Right. It's a very easy system because everything is now computerized. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have we have uh, everything in the system via passports. A lot of money mm -hmm. has been spent to make sure that everything is in, in one computer system, right. not just the athletes, also the officials. So every day, by the end of the competition, the computer will do the work for us. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the decision is 4-1, mm -hmm. we check why is there one. Mm -hmm. What has he seen, what the other four didn't see. If that happened twice in a day, then we look, analyze ourselves, who was a bias, mm. okay, because some have the tie syndrome, okay, as soon as the tie fighter goes in the ring, he won before he threw the first kick, <laughs> okay, or is he biased with another country, right. or is he just not experienced enough to maybe come from kickboxing or whatever mm. and scores different techniques different mm. to the other four judges. Then we take this particular official to the side and he will get an extra course. Mm. If he does that happen again on the same day, the second day, he'll be sidelined. Mm. Okay, it's a very easy system because you have 80 officials that cannot be all exactly the same standard. Right. But that's why we have five on the table. Mm -hmm. In fact, we may gonna change it to three soon, okay, to, to have more qualified ones. Mm -hmm. This is our new thinking at the moment. We may go back to the professional where we only have three judges, so that means it lowers the chances right. of, you know, the outlier <laughs> of the ones which are not as experienced. Right. Okay, but at the end of the day, if you have like uh, four rings, 30 fights on each ring, mm. we have 120 fights a day, mm. you know, so you need to have referees because if you sit there from three until nine, no. you lose concentration. Yes, yeah. it's hard. You know? And they're not allowed to bring mobiles, they're not allowed to interfere, yeah. they're not allowed to leave the ring, they only can go to the toilet and back. It is hard work. Yes. For me, the, the officials and obviously the P1, mm. they're the hardest worker on any event. Mm. P1 even on top for me, yeah. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> but for the referees, it's not easy to sit there for six hours and focus. Yeah. When you make a change to the um, scoring, for example, I've read that there is a change in the scoring of throws and um, sweeps, that these are going to be potentially fouls. Is, there will be there actually like no change in scoring. We just make sure that the scoring is real more time. Mm -hmm. You know, because at the beginning, some referee they allow judo sweeps, mm -hmm. which are elite. Right. You know what I mean? We just have to make sure that, like in football, when you touch the ball, okay, as a defender, mm -hmm. and it goes over the line, it's a corner kick. Mm. And it's a corner kick, doesn't matter which referee, if you're from Israel or from Iran or from the United States, it's a corner kick. So we have to make sure that everyone understands the same scoring and pushes the button. Okay? At the same time, mm. if there is a clean shot. And in order to, to take the fouls off, it is not the judge's job, it's the referee's job. Mm. The referee must warn or caution the athlete, and if he caution for the second or third time, then must take mm. the point. Mm. For the officials, they judge the fight. The right. fouls, the safety, and to ensure the rules and regulations is the sentiments. Mm. It's the sentiments job. Mm. So the sentiment, for us, plays the most important part. Right. Because he obviously ensures the rules, but he ensures the safety. And so these are like the top dogs of your that is officials. Sure. That is for sure. <laughs> yeah. So by example, for the Youth World Championship, only the top referees are allowed to go in the center ring mm. because there is no room for errors. Mm. So we don't let unexperienced referees go and let two 10-year-old kids mm. compete. So they are really, the top guys are in there to ensure uh, the safety of the kids. Mm. With the, with the transparency in scoring, which is a big part of the IFMA mission, um, 
when you watch, you can actually see who won round one, who won yes. round two. It can lead to a very deflated round three <laughs> because you know who won already and the fighter knows who won already. Is there any kind there, of... There, we also will do changes. Mm. Mm. We're going with this mm. because in the old days, you could, you have to declare a winner mm -hmm. in each round. Mm -hmm. So it has to be a 10-9. Yes. So we may, in the first round, allow to have a draw. Oh. That would be interesting. That is <laughs> because smart, yeah. Because, you see, if, you, if you're already 2018, yes. yes. all yes. you have to do is dance around the ring. <laughs> and boring. you bring the fight, <laughs> yeah. fight home. Yeah. The, but the criticism that fifth round uh, Thailand has is that, so. Exactly the same. Yeah. So we will change this rule on the elite level mm -hmm. that the first round can be a draw. Right. That has, will have many effects. Number one, they're going to go much harder in the first round. Mm. W would that not lead to possible draws? No. Because going into the third round, one fighter will have a one point lead, right? But then you have. I cannot give too much. Oh, okay. <laughs> because they have a jury, which also is okay. true. Okay. P possible. The things you're working and out. Jury, things you're working no, out. Yeah. The jury, let's say the three, the three people sitting on the main table, they also will push the button. Uh, interesting. So a, a, tie, a potential tie would be broken. All right. So if, if it's like a tie on the ring, yes. there may not be a tie with the jury. Mm. Oh, that's very interesting. And that makes it. See, number one. The transparency for the audience is most important. I do not want to name and blame other sports, mm. okay? But obviously in the past, especially the Olympics in boxing, there have been very a lot of mm. controversies. Yeah. Okay, so for you, if you go into the A-Sport system, you even will see which referee scored for and against. Mm. We want the people to know to the last detail the transparency. Mm. That's very important. The audience know it's 10-10. Yeah. And the fighter afterwards can see 3-2, Casa, whatever, Russia, Australia, mm. for me, America, Canada, against me, example. Mm. So you know, there's no secret. Right. It makes it also easy for us with the protests, because on the end of the day, the next ruling, to give away by example, <laughs> could be that you have no, you can't protest anymore. Mm. The only protest you can do is against the referee, yeah. but not against the judges. Mm. The decision is the decision. Finished. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Because it's just bad. <laughs> you see it happening. You see it happening. Yeah. You know what I mean? Everyone knows. The coach knows. Yeah. The fighter can look. Everyone yeah. knows. Yeah. So why are you going to protest? Mm. Yeah. In, our, in our first discussion, one of the most uh, inspiring, incredible takeaways was the emphasis that the IFMA has in um, equality in bringing women into the sport and being very hardline about it. Like, if you're going to bring your team, you're going to have women, whether this works in the traditional culture of your country or not. Um, I'm curious because one of the things that I see, because I follow female Muay Thai in Thailand, is that a lot of the elite level female fighters age out of being able to fight in the kind of traditional way that men get to fight. They get to go to Lumpani, Rajadamner, and um, big side bet fights. But in this most recent IFMA um, qualifier, I don't know what this was just now in Bangkok, you have the best of the best women fighting each other that would not be fighting each other in side bet fights because of the politics around that. So my question is, do you think that um, part of the mission of the IFMA to bring equality and bring women up has an effect on the Muay Thai in Thailand apart from IFMA, or do you think that it's kind of separate? Like, is is the goal of women fighting at Lumpani and Rajadhanar an issue or even a, an interest or a possibility from what the IFMA is doing? I will answer this in two parts. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, first of all, the traditions in Thailand need to change. Thirteen. And we are very much fighting on this. Mm. And we are going all out. Mm. Okay, especially if it comes to child protection, mm. child welfare, and so on. We're talking about, first of all, let's go to the case of this poor kid that just died a couple of months yeah. ago. Let me mm. First of all, this is so wrong from all levels. Starting with the caretaker, mm. allowing that kid to fight every 10 days professional. 
to the gym, putting them in the front, to the promoter, to the bad referee. Mm. There are so many people we could put on the stand, but at the end of the day, the biggest problem is the law. Mm. Okay, if you allow a six-year-old kid to fight full professional, then this is wrong. It is wrong for so many reasons. These kids are training like professionals. Before school, they run, they, and everything else, which comes with it, okay? So, we do not want to stop kids fighting. It's very important, sport is sport, you play rugby, you know, right? mm. Okay, but there need to be certain rules. And the protection of the children is our main concern. If you're eight years old, you cannot get elbow to the head. Okay, you get elbow in the head, you elbow yourself with pads mm. and a head guard, and you don't get cut, and you don't get knocked down and whatever. So this is something now, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks, the law will be passed, okay, and the law will go on the same fast. Mm -hmm. Because Thailand want to be in line with the Olympic movement, and on the other side, uh, they need to protect the children. Mm -hmm. And second, we need to talk about children protection in other ways. Okay, we're talking about bullying, sexual abuse. There are so many other things which we need to be educating them still that this is the norm. You look into gymnastics in the United States for so many years. So we need to have child protection clauses, which we very much have, and the National Federation of Thailand needs to implement them, like everyone else, mm -hmm. and then do it this. This is the most important. Now, Thailand, in other ways, are more advanced than other countries. Okay, coming to funding mm -hmm. of Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the World Games have become their highest event in the calendar now because it's the second event under the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Muay Thai is in it. So that means they want to send their top athletes in the games, and that means male and female. Mm -hmm. So that means the girls get funded proper. Mm -hmm. They get a lot of money for gold medal. Okay, it's a lot of money. <laughs> okay, so that means the best of the best, their dream is now to get into the national team. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're talking about the opportunities this year is our four games in Australia. You have the Asian Championships in um, Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. You have the World Championships in Bangkok. All these are funded events. So that means you get into the SAT when you make the team, you get trained, you get per team, mm. you win a gold, silver or bronze, you get paid like an Olympic athlete. Mm. So obviously now everyone wants to be in the national team. So in that improve the national championships in Thailand by, by months. Right. There's not all, let's say talk to the females, all the top female fighters they want to make it in the national team because winning, imagine you win the World Championship, you win the Asian Championship, you win the Arafura game, mm -hmm. you nearly have two million bucks. Right. <laughs> and the, again, this is, you're talking about the pyramid. There are very few who actually get to go and, and vie for this kind of award. But you think that the promise of that or the um, influence of that trickles down into the way that women are given opportunities or young girls are aiming to be on the national team when they're younger, whereas before it's like, I fight in my province and then retire when I'm 15. I think it's a development in general. Mm. It's a development in general because now, no one, first of all, they didn't have these opportunities before. Yeah. Okay, and Thailand did not send strong female teams because in the past they thought they're not competitive mm. against Sweden right. or Finland or whatever, okay? Mm. So now they understand they are, mm. because they have the athletes. Mm. They have everything in their own country. So now, from the provinces, they first have the province championships. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have, I'm not sure, Suratani. Okay, example. You have the province championship, you make it to the national. Right. And from the national, you have the chance to fight at a top level, earning big money. Mm. Second, you're allowed to wear the colors. The colors of Thailand? Meaning the National Olympic Committee of Thailand, official mm. colors, when you go to this event, because Muay Thai 
is fully recognized by the National Olympic Committee. Mm -hmm. So what that means, they get the highest honor to fight really for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So for them, that's very important. It's huge for women. Yeah. So it starts now that the DPE starts to get it more popular mm -hmm. on the grassroots level. The provinces, they want to have their own efforts now in the national team from their province. Right. So they're pushing harder. Right. And obviously, the team is becoming much stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Especially the lower weight divisions, very difficult to beat. Yes. Yeah. But the good news is that other countries have become stronger too, France or whatever. They do. They're amazing. The the smaller weight classes in all the countries right now are incredible. So right now, let's say between the ten or eleven weight divisions we have, there is no more favorites. Mm. And that's because you have the Sofia Olsen, which are very strong, mm. but she can be beaten right. by a tie. Right. You know, so it has become very, very, very equal. Mm -hmm. And for us, it is also important to, and I'll give you another secret, okay, for us it's also very important that we do this also on the professional. Mm -hmm. So by example, we are now planning the next series of Challenger, and it will be male and female. Mm -hmm. Where will it be? Can't tell you yet. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. it is in June, and it will be equal, yeah. male and female, yeah. in the house. Amazing. So Oof. this is a very important step. That Wait, this is going to, for sure, you feel strong about this, that it's going to happen. 80%? Very strong. Very strong, nice. <laughs> very strong. Wow. Okay, so, because you're pushing for it. Yeah. Okay, and obviously we are behind it, so very it's very exciting. important that we have this. So this is for us a major breakthrough is that A, the World Games, mm. we are 50-50, 100%, that's already confirmed. And then if we do the next season of Challenger, 50-50. Mm. Wow. Uh, also there, and I think then we are on the right track. Yeah. I, I feel like obviously there's a huge benefit and burst in um, when you send the World Games to a country, it bolsters that country's Muay Thai. When you have a place like uh, the US, it's gonna be in Alabama in 2021, as an American, this is an odd place, <laughs> but it America as a country um, does not have the same pyramid structure as sending it to Africa, for example. They do have money in America more, but American Muay Thai is very disparate. What kind of effects do you feel happen when you send World Games to a particular place? First of all, for the national team, it's very important. Mm -hmm. Because America can get a full team. Mm -hmm. They don't have to qualify. Right. They only have to qualify internally. Uh. Mm. Okay, so they're gonna get six boys and six girls. Right. Mm. Okay, so this is our rule mm. to make sure that over the next two years they build it to their strongest possible team right. to represent the United States. And by then, I'm very certain that they will be fully recognized by the Olympic Committee. Mm. So there'll be also funding available. Mm. So for the development of the country, mm. it's very important. Mm. Okay, because there's only like 88 efforts. I know it's more this year because one more division. Okay, let's say 96 efforts. Mm -hmm. Over a two year qualifying period, very, very hard, mm -hmm. especially in 134 member countries. Right. And you know that Thailand, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, <laughs> and the United States probably have a third of all the fights. The Russian team is huge. Mm -hmm. Every time it comes, it's so many people. No, but they only can have six efforts, makes right. sense. There is a quota. Mm. Yeah. Okay, but they will get their six mm. Mm. in Belarus and Ukraine mm. because they have money. So they pick their qualifying events very carefully. Mm. They travel. Mm. If there's a qualifying event at the Arab Flora Games, they'd rather go to Australia as to qualify the World Championships. Right. So it's much easier. Yeah. So they, by the other countries, they come to the World Championship and they get only this one chance. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Much more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So you know that. In the world games, it will be the best of the best. Mm. The question is who will qualify for Thailand? Right.
teaching room for all the kids free of charge. They can learn English, computer, kids with autism, different abilities. All of them, they have their own center up there where they all can come and sit together, play together. So we have a deal with the university. The universities and lecturers, psychologists, whatever. Yeah. So it's okay kids. This is part of it too? Yeah, this is the education center. It's oh, where the kids come for the lectures and programs. And oh, wow. School, There's not, nothing like this in Thailand. Oh, no. or many other places in the world. So they're here like this? for all the kids with disabilities or Muslim women or whatever. Mm -hmm. They have their own training room, yeah. their own showers and toilets. So they can totally undisturbed yes. practice. And this is just for the kids. So they have different groups here, depends on their abilities. Wow. So this is where they do English classes, computer classes. Oh my goodness, so they learn to use the IT, they learn English, they learn. Come on, come on. <laughs> dedicated to an amazing project. So this is for kids with autism. Is it ongoing uh, project uh, or are there individual times that? Individuals. It be the, depends on, on the project. Mm. You know? So it's like a project space kind of. It's, we give it to them. There is one. United to Sport is our partner. So we work with them and they, they run the center. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. I love talking to Stefan. He's brilliant and always good to go and see him. Always has a lot to say. Uh, if you guys don't know who I am, I am a fighter and Muay Thai journalist living in Thailand. Um, I fight a lot and I cover a lot. Everything that I do is supported by Patron. So if you guys are interested in content like this and supporting the things that I'm doing here, Go to the link in the description, check out Patron, and thank you very much.